we're going to go ahead and get started with the panel. And then, uh, then I think um, we will in for the folks who are in the room in DC, we can screen the video again at the end. Um, and I also pasted the chat to the the video link in the chat here on Zoom. And so, uh, for those of you who aren't in the room, you can click on it and watch it remotely on your own time. But since we don't have a lot of time together, I do want to go ahead and, and get started. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Zibarts. I am the director of the Disability Mobility Initiative. Uh, we're a program of Disability Rights Washington in Washington State. And I recently joined the board of the League of American Cyclists and um, excited to be part of, uh, part of the organization and um, yeah, be here today with you all with this amazing panel of folks that I've gotten to know in the last couple of years. So the reason I'm, I'm particularly interested in this conversation is I myself am low vision. I was born with a visual impairment called nystagmus. That means that my eyes wiggle all the time and so I don't see well enough to drive, but I do see well enough to ride a bike. And so biking for me has been a, a real source of uh, freedom and movement and mobility uh, where I've lived in Washington state, in Arizona, in New York City, and when I've been able to travel to other parts of the country. And so I wanted to share with you some perspectives of other folks I've gotten to know who um, bike and who are disabled and have them share their stories so we can start to expand the conversation around biking and disability and understand that there are many of us out there who um, maybe aren't obviously physically disabled when you look at us and some of us are and some of us you once you once you uh, start to notice things a little more you'll know that we are disabled um, but that, that that doesn't matter what matters is that biking for us is a wonderful way to get around or can be um, with right access points and, and we want to share our perspectives with you today. So I am going to go ahead and let uh, the panel introduce themselves with an introductory question. Um, we'll start with Ivy. I'm going to go in the order of my screen. Ivy, then Leroy, then Devin. And the question is, uh, first introduce yourself. Tell me where you live. Um, what is your physical environment like where you live? Because we all are living in different parts of the country. And how do you get around? And how does biking fit or not fit so well into that? Um, so go ahead. Uh, we'll start with Ivy, then Leroy, then Devin. Hi, folks. Um, really happy to be here. Thank, thank you for inviting me. Um, I uh, live in Tucson, Arizona, actually in the town of Oro Valley, which is Northwest Tucson. Um, and um, I have, we have lived down here for 20 years. I'm originally from Canada. Um, and I just, I love living down here, especially since I depend on uh, my bike to get around. Um, previous to this, I actually would drive a golf cart around. So that's a, a whole other story, but still a very um, cool way. And because the weather is just so nice most of the year, I mean, we do get really cold in the morning, in the winter, and it gets really hot in the summer. But for the most part, it's um, a bikeable um, environment all the time. And um, in Oro Valley, um, I was actually <laughs> looking it up, but Oro Valley is a town that was awarded a gold level um, for um, friendly biking business from the League of American um, Bicyclists. So um, there's a lot of shared use paths, a lot of um, bike um, routes and facilities. And um, it's just Tucson and um, Oro Valley really encourage a lot of cycling and biking, a lot of bike races and things. I'm not in bike races, but um, but just the infrastructure to get around is, is really good. For the most part, it's not perfect, but it is really good. So, um, and I ride a, um, a Momentum V to E plus um, electric bike, um, bright red. <laughs> I figured the brighter the color, the easier it was going to be for other people to see me. So, <laughs> so I have... <laughs> I have red sneakers and I have a red coat in the wintertime and I just figured the brighter I am better. So um, I don't know if that answered all your questions, but um, yeah, that's that's where I live. Thanks, Ivy. Awesome. Um, Leroy, you're next. 
Hello, Leroy Moore here. I'm a quiet man with salt and pepper here, sitting in my kitchen wearing orange hoodie. So now I live in LA. I think it's the worst place for where boys are going. Um, I, I used to live in the Bay Area. I used to live in Berkeley, but I used to ride my bike everywhere. The Berkeley is so small, you can ride your bike around Berkeley. Um, but since moving to LA, it's like the car land of, of the US. They they drive their car to the corner store. That's 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 how they load their cars. And since I moved to LA for um, graduate school at UCLA, I, I I haven't had a chance to use my bike because I live on a hill. And yeah, I can get down, but getting back up would be almost impossible. So because of that, I haven't really, really ride my bike since moving here two years ago, which is unfortunately. Uh, but I, I got into cycling back in the 80s when I was introduced to um, United Cerebral Palsy Association. And they had a sports team, which I joined, and I did um, wheelchair soccer and um, cycling. So that's, that's when I got um, used to cycling, um, three, three wheel cycling. I went to the Paralympics back in 88. And um, yeah, yeah, so that's me. Well, yeah, I do. I do miss my my bike, and I hope, hopefully, after this PhD, um, we're thinking of moving to New Mexico, which is more flat and more accessible. So, I hope I can ride my bike more there. Awesome, thanks, Leroy. And Leroy is one of the folks who's featured in the video. Um, that video is a video we produced uh, with NACTO, with support from NACTO back in 2020. So if uh, you do have a chance to watch it on your own time, I encourage you to check it out to hear some more voices. But uh, Devin, turn it over to you. Hey, uh, my name is Devin Silvernail. Uh, I, I live in Seattle, uh, in Southeast Seattle specifically, um, which is an area of the city uh, that is honestly not very... Uh, friendly to folks outside of cars. Um, you know, we, I guess as as the car drives, we're probably about three miles, four miles out, outside of the city center. Um, by bike, it's closer to six. Um, folks understand what that means. Um, you know, it's, it's quite hilly and the roads are in pretty bad condition. Uh, the neighborhood itself uh, was purposefully hemmed in uh, by two by two interstate highways, and then we had two state well one state highway and one planned state highway running through the neighborhood. So uh, I think that can really give an illustration of the conditions. Uh, because of that, really, our uh, the district that we're in in the city, uh, we have the highest rate of pedestrian deaths, the highest rate of collisions. Uh, it's Honestly, not a not a wonderful place to ride a bike, but um, it's it's when you don't really have a choice, you kind of just have to go with the flow. Uh, I ride an urban arrow family, uh, so you know I use that to get my kid to school, to get myself to work, and um, you know it's a little bit of a challenge, but it's you know you find the joy in the little things, right? And it's still it's still joyful despite. <laughs> despite all of the things that I just mentioned. Um, and I happen to be um, a person with nystagmus and a neighbor of Anna. So kind of, we got the, the two for two going on there. Thanks, Evan. Um, and uh, yeah, so I wanna, I wanna dig into some more of the barriers that we talked about. And I know, I know you all mentioned some of those in your intros, but I wanna go a little deeper. Uh, we were having a, a brainstorm before this with, with the, the four of us, and I think some of the things that came up were the lack of infrastructure, obviously, uh, the lack of places to ride safely, the confusion around where to be riding bikes, sidewalks, streets, if, if you don't have good infrastructure, enforcement and interactions with police, um, theft, 
where to store things securely, how to lock bikes, especially if they're non-traditional bikes that are bigger and aren't, um, we haven't designed bike, um, bike locking systems for them, um, bike parking systems. So I, I, I want you all, you can, I know, I know you all have your own individual stories here. And so just pick, I know uh, there's probably a million uh, barriers you can describe, but maybe pick one or two that you think most profoundly impact your ability to, to bike and to get around. And let's start this time with Leroy and then we'll do Devin and end with Ivy. Okay, I'll make it quick. Two two big things that affect me the most. One is um, being pulled over by police constantly on my bike and now on my scooter. But now I ride, I ride a scooter and being stopped by LAPD cops. Just makes no sense. So that um, constantly, you know, in Berkeley, was, was stopped and pulled off my bike. Um, and it's interesting. I think I stopped twice in one day and on one street and one one cop told me to, to, to don't um, drive on the main road. And another cop, like two hours later, told me to drive only on the main road and not on the side streets. So that is it tells you how much uh, they um, communicate with, with each other. So that, that that was a big part of my life still is. But uh, number two is getting my bike stolen. Um, I went through four bikes so far and trikes cost a lot of money. It cost like 12 to $2,000 even more. So I've got my bike thrown like three or four times um, from public transportation. Um, in the Bay Area, you had BART called the subway. And I used to lock my bike at the subway station and just get on the subway. Bike is way too large for taking on the subway. So I locked it up, locked it up with three locks, three locks that cost like a hundred to two hundred dollars and none of them work. I come back and bike will be gone and the locks will be gone. I was like, God, you guys take the locks too? <laughs> so um so yeah that, that that was still is a big a big um a big hinder. It's like where where, where can you park your bike safely. And although um, Berkeley had like box, lock, box lockers, I think a bike doesn't fit in the locker. So you, you're forced to park on the street or on the, you know, yeah. So, so yeah, so for me, it's one police and two trying to find a safe place to lock my bike. Yeah, oh my gosh, that bike storing thing is is huge. I was actually pretty excited. I got to meet Kinsia, who's in the video, um, who um, rides tandems with the, oh my gosh, and I'm get to, gonna get the acronym, acronym wrong, but it's the Metro Association of Blind Athletes, I think. And they actually were able to convince the DC Metro to put a tandem sized locker at one of the, the metro stations, which I thought was pretty cool. And they had, I think, three or four tandems stored inside that. Um, and it's just, you know, it's totally possible to have these bigger bike blockers, but we're just not, um, you know, they're not they're not getting built. They're not getting installed. Um, Devin, do you want to go next and, and talk about some of the barriers? or um, And maybe, I don't know, some of the things, since uh, you're involved a lot with advocacy in, in some capacity, some of the things you are working on to get changed. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think obviously the biggest barrier is infrastructure um, in that, you know, that I think that is on street facilities and it's it's bike parking like Leroy talked about. I totally feel that pain. Like there's no nowhere I can park my bike um, easily or safely. And, and I use three locks, too. So <laughs> I, I know that feeling. Um, and, uh, you know, I think about like. Um, 
when I was younger, you know, before I had a family, um, and when I was honestly a little bit more of a daredevil, um, I, and, you know, I'd ride my fixie around the city and, you know, whatever, and I was in a different mindset, but I would very easily be able to transfer between the bus and my bike and the train and my bike, et cetera, because I could bring it on the train or I could put it on the bus. Um, but obviously, you know, with bigger bikes like ours, you you can't, and, and that, that really sucks. Um, you know, likewise, our infrastructure, when it's built, it's not built for people who, um, you know, who have these kind of non-traditional bike sizes, but it's also not built for people who, um, you know, who are risk averse, honestly. So again, when I was younger, I would, I would ride down multi-lane streets. Um, when I lived in San Francisco, I would ride between the muni buses, um, you know, the things that I could not physically do anymore. And, and so you see in Seattle, for example, when we're building bike lanes, um, even though a lot of the folks at the department are part of NACTO, for example, we're not building up to those design standards. Uh, you know, so our bike lanes a lot of times are four feet wide. Um, we're still not making the investment in, in solid infrastructure that can support people um, of all ages and abilities. You're not being separated from cars. Um, you know, in the South End where I live, for example, we don't have any kind of bike lanes that are physically separated from cars. Um, and you know that that's a huge problem. That's a huge deterrent, uh, especially when you hear people say, "Well, you know, there's enough bike lanes in the city," um, and, and they point to a part of the city that has good bike infrastructure. No, that those do exist, but we are not connected to them. Um, I should also say only about five percent of city streets in Seattle have any kind of bike infrastructure, which includes Sharrows. Um, and then, Anna, you alluded to, you know, my advocacy work. <laughs> um, I work for the city. Um, I work for uh, a council member, and I, I would consider that advocacy. I think you can do a lot of activism through legislation. Um, and we push the department a lot, uh, uh, the the transportation department a lot. Um, we we've been considering legislation and looking into that, re researching that, talking to folks from cities across the country and across the world. Um, but, you know, our biggest tool is the budget. And, and so you know, we forced the department to make investments in the South End this year um, through what's called a budget proviso, which basically forces them to spend the money the way that we want them to. Uh, you know, we we've, we've put money toward home zones. We put money toward sidewalks, things like that are very basic that our district doesn't have. And, and I think that's where we need to start it is um, influencing the budget of our local governments to get these things moving. Because uh, the departments, I'm sad to say, I don't think they're going to do it on their own. And uh, that's really my, my biggest kind of, I guess, uh, tidbit I can give folks. Thanks, Evan. Ivy, I, I would love to hear some more from you around. Uh, so when I met Ivy, um, this was sort of before the the e bike revolution, and so um, Ivy and I thought this was so cool. Um, I was living in Tucson, and uh, we connected because we had the same eye condition. And Ivy was using a golf cart to get around, which I thought was pretty neat. But definitely, you know, um, one of those things where there's um, there's not the infrastructure set up to get places that you need to go. Um, I mean, you want to talk about, you know, your years um, using the golf cart? With sure. Um, some of yeah, the challenges I mean, and barriers encountered there and the difference now with biking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Go for it. So when we moved to Tucson, um, I had two kids in elementary school and, um, and because I didn't drive, we said to the real estate agent, we need to live within walking distance to an elementary school. And um and so that was great. We, we got that. But then a friend of mine, about a, maybe less than a year uh, after living there, she's like, oh, you should get a golf cart because people drive golf carts all over the place. And, you know, I had to really do some research to see if it was worth it for me. Um, there are, you know, a lot of golf courses down here. A lot of the neighborhoods are connected um, to golf courses so that people who own a golf court, uh, golf cart can get there on their own. Um, 
So it's, you know, that part of it was kind of, it's more focused towards those who are doing it for recreation, not transportation. <laughs> but um, I bought a golf cart and I, I had, uh, it was a um, refurbished one with a rear facing back seat. I had them install seat belts <laughs> because my kids were little. And, um, and so I, you know, I, I talked to the local um, general manager of the, the closest golf course to me because I could go down through it about a mile through the golf course through the neighborhood to get to where the grocery store was the the dentist the hairdresser the bank the, everything was on that corner and the roads that connect our our um, neighborhoods like we're all in these neighborhoods but these arterial roads or whatever they're they're more like 40, 45 miles an hour, and you're not allowed to drive on them with a golf cart. It's the, I had to look at the rules. It's like 35 miles an hour or less, you can be on it. Now, you're also supposed to be registered and licensed, <laughs> which I was not because I don't have a driver's license with my low vision. I've never been able to drive a car. And, um, and so I was, you know, kind of, doing that part of it illegally but um and I've I've had instances where the police would pull me over and say oh you're not supposed to be here or whatever and again it's they don't know the rules <laughs> so you know that that's not really their expertise but um for many many years that's how I got around and it was very helpful I could um, over the years, a lot more infrastructure was built the roads were improved the shared use paths were put in and I could get even farther. I could get to a Walmart. I could get to a Target. I could get to all kinds of different places. And, and that golf cart was handy and I could do that. And I, um, you know, I would cross crosswalks with the golf cart. Um, but over the time, uh, you know, my kids grew up, they started driving, they started driving me around. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I just wasn't driving the golf cart as much. I didn't need it. Um, and the batteries would die. So I got rid of the golf cart and a couple of years ago bought the electric bike. And I just, it has been so much like, it just has given me a lot more freedom. I, I can go anywhere on a bike and nobody says anything, you know, like there's, there, there aren't rules so much with the bike that there were with the golf cart. There was with the golf cart, there was, um, um, restrictions for, you know, the paths, you know, you're not supposed to drive on sidewalks and things like that. I mean, um, and even with bikes, for the most part, you're not supposed to drive on sidewalks. But for me, um, sometimes the safest way for me to get somewhere, because it's, you know, I'm driving next to one of those big roads um, that doesn't have a bike lane, I would drive on the sidewalk. And I, I do drive on the sidewalk instead. So, um, yeah, the things that, um, you know, are kind of a hindrance or can be a problem is those connections. Like we have all those amazing shared use paths. We have different bike routes and things, but they're a lot of times they're designed for the people who are doing it for recreation and not doing it as a, I'm going around to do my errands and trying to get here and there and, you know, stop at a bunch of different places. And, and the, those connection points between the shared use paths and the regular residential streets or the commercial where the retail is or whatever, that can be a, a problem sometimes. Um, the other thing too, because of, you know, we live in the desert, we have a lot of uh, nature that happens. <laughs> um, and I live, and one of the reasons that we moved into the neighborhood that we live in now, which isn't the neighborhood that our, um, we first moved, moved into, um, the main reason that we live there, one of them is because the shared use path meets up with the road that connects from the highway to the entrance into our neighborhood. And it gives me immediate access onto the shared use path. It tunnels underneath the highway and comes up on the other side and connects all the way along the, I say highway, but it's, you know, it's a basically a, a divided road. It's a main, and it is a highway that, that goes all the way from I-10 to, to Oracle. And, um, 
and, and that can get me everywhere. That gives me so much freedom to be able to access that safely without having to cross, you know, a four lane highway basically. Um, and, but the problem is a lot of times that little strip of my shared juice path, um, it's not used by as many people as the main one. And, and when the road maintenance people come and do the cleanup and all that kind of stuff, they sometimes forget that spot. They forget that little strip. And I have to, you know, there's been numerous times I've had to call the town and say, hey, can you come and clean this up? Because, you know, branches will grow across the road. And, and you know, with my low vision, that, that's kind of one of the hindrances. It's, it's those things that you don't expect. The things that, you know, whether it's sand on the path or, um, you know, branches in the way or curbs that you're not expecting a curb to be there. Um, even the, the closest intersection to me, the, the median where the crosswalk is, the median is halfway across the crosswalk. So if we, and it's, it's a place where there's, there's people cycling in both directions. It connects the shared use path. Now, why they have to put a median along the, in the middle of the crosswalk, it like, it, it's, it's a problem. It can cause an accident. So, um, you know, that and because of my vision, I can't see drivers. I can't see into car windows. And a lot of times, you know, people be like, oh yeah, you go or you, you know, I don't see them doing that. I have to expect that they're going to do what they're going to do. And that I, I have to expect that they're going to see me and I have to expect they're going to obey the law. <laughs> so that that's, those are some of my kind of biggest things that I have to deal with, I think, even though we've got great infrastructure, it's the, the unexpected things um, that, that happen to be what might cause an accident. <laughs> yeah, totally. Thanks, Ivy. Yeah, the, the, the maintenance of the existing infrastructure, I think, is something that doesn't necessarily get paid attention to, and especially if it's not the highway. I want to um, go to Leroy next and ask this is sort of, a, we'll start with Leroy, a, a, a general question, because we don't have a ton of time left, but um, what would an accessible community look like for you? And I know this is, you know, I think part of it, right, is the infrastructure, but that's connected to where there's housing, where there's affordable housing, where there's grocery stores, like all the things that we need to be able to live our lives and go where we need to go. For you, Leroy, what what would an accessible community look like? Oh, I to me, it's just really thinking and putting into action people with disabilities issues. For example, in LA, you know, the Olympics and the pandemic is coming to LA in the next three to four years. And, you know, people in organizations and governments are going off the wall trying to get it ready. But in, in their planning, it's like really little around disability. So although Parks and Rec got like a $3 million grant, I still don't see no accessibility going forth around Park and Rec and, and you know, coming up to the Olympics and Paralympics. So I see, I, I see that um, city governments, um, legislators, advocates need to know about accessibility, need to know about our laws, and need to know that you know their work should um, you know implement city laws, disability laws that are on the books. So we're not asking for anything, we're just asking for them to do their job. So they make um, you know our environment more accessible. You know, I I saw when gentrification hit in the Bay Area, you know, all of a sudden we had curb cuts and everything in the hood. It's like, what? It's like, what's happening? It's like, oh, it's gentrification now. You know, city governments are waking up because of tech money and, you know, tech people moving in and all of a sudden we're getting 
things that we've been screaming out for decades. So, you know, it's, it's, it's you know the same story, different decade, I guess. Yeah, Devin, I feel like you're nodding. <laughs> do you want to uh, <laughs> continue that conversation with, yeah, how do you? I mean, what, what does an accessible community look like? And, you know, I guess, you know, this challenge of when there is all this investment with tech money or Olympics money or, you know, we've seen such growth here in Seattle too. When that yeah. money comes in, what happens? Yeah, and I'll say, you know, I, I recognize that too because I lived in the East Bay. <laughs> I lived and I lived in the city and, and I saw like what happened with the places that happened, you know, the infrastructure came after the rich people came and, um, and that's just kind of how America functions. It's really, it's really sad. And, you know, I think um, we've seen that in Seattle as well, uh, you know, the, the more central neighborhoods um, are really nice now. <laughs> Um, and that just happens to coincide with the areas of the city that the, the richest people like to live in. Um, and I think that's where we're just backwards in this country, honestly, where we, we make investments in, in places, um, you know, for people that already have a lot. And, um, you know, we just, I think we have to look outside of our borders. Um, we, I mean, I know in Seattle, in our office, we're looking at our sister cities in other countries because, you know, they're making really great um, advances in accessibility and affordability, you know, building really dense, um, socially mixed and mixed use incomes. I, I want to say socially mixed is really, really important. Um, having, uh, you know, places where people of, of all backgrounds and all incomes, you know, having, um, uh, having like income uh, uh, diversity, and having cultural diversity, having racial diversity, those things are all really important. And, and that's that should be our, our starting point for, for building accessible communities too. Um, and you know, that's as simple as having very you know, basic services, schools, playgrounds, grocery stores, doctors' offices, um, you know, places that offer culturally relevant food to the communities, um, having all of those things within you know, a quarter mile of your house. If you can, if you can walk there, or if you can take a mobility device there, um, you know, that I, I, I see is true accessibility and then connecting neighborhoods. So you don't have to go across the city to, <laughs> to go do grocery shopping or go to your doctor or, you know, to do any number of things to go to work. Um, so for me, you know, that's, that's really what gives me kind of um, inspiration. And there's there's plenty of places that are doing it. And I think in America, we just have to catch up. Totally, thanks, Devin. I think, yeah, you uh, you have made me think more about, yeah, how it's, it, we, we think these things are so impossible and there aren't models that work and, and there are, and maybe we just need to look um, look beyond what's not working here. So um, we are almost at time and we have five minutes and I wanna give everyone sort of a chance to say anything else that you wanted to share that you haven't shared yet. I feel like one, one question that I'll, I'll just throw out there. And so if you wanna answer this, you can is, what do you think, so the, the audience here at, at, at the Bike Summit is a lot of folks who work in bike advocacy from all over the country. I was there in DC for a couple of days and it was really amazing to, to see and meet people from from really every you know every, every state and many 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 communities within those states and I know there's even more folks online and I think um, that that power of that network is pretty exciting and so thinking about that as your audience uh, right now what do you think the bike community and bike advocates what what would you tell them about why it's important to seek out and listen to and highlight and prioritize the needs of Folks who bike for transportation, uh, folks who don't have the privilege of driving, folks who are disabled and poor um, and black and brown. Like, why, why does it matter to do this work in a way that, um, that really highlights the needs of folks who have the least transportation security? Um, and so if you want to respond to that question, you can. If you want to say something else in your closing remarks, go for it. Let's... Uh, Let's do uh, Leroy, Ivy, Devin. Well, um, you know, having 
you know, our structure, you know, accessible. It's not, it's not like, you know, he, he, Elon Musk can go to space with this multi-million dollar space thing. We, we all are sharing the same roads, you know? So that, that, that right there should make people realize that, you know, that these roads need to be accessible. You know, um, when Biden ran in for president, he was talking about in infrastructure. We're still, we're still waiting for that infrastructure, you know? We're still waiting for that, you know, making the infrastructure more accessible. So I, I, I just think that um, real, 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 realizing that all the roads and bike bike lanes are shared by everyone. So making it a university Universal accessibility helps everyone. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, and that there are yeah that 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 there are so many folks who need that that universal accessibility, right? Even if if you don't know people, then you're missing out because we exist and there's a lot of us out there. And let's look a little a little deeper. All right, Ivy. Yeah, I mean. Um... Really, this is this is all very new to me. I'm just a girl on a bike. I'm not like I'm not connected really to an organization or anything. I mean, I I'm just living my own experience. And this just being a part of this bike summit has really um, educated me on um, the the people, the organizations that are out there, what what concerns them, and it really it gives me. Um, you know, some confidence to approach, you know, whether it's my local government or to um, get people connected, uh, bring people together. I think it's really important to, to talk to people with disabilities because I think, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to call us the lowest denominator here, but, but, you know, what, what concerns us as far as safety goes is going to concern everybody. And each one of us, depending on our um, disabilities or abilities or, um, you know, how we see the world, each one of us, depending on, you know, our own physical limitations, experience the world in a different way. And we may see things that other people don't. And, um, and I think it's just, it's important to talk to people like us who are using the infrastructure um, probably more often than most other people. There may be lots of other people who are using it, but, but we're using it, um, you know, in our lives maybe more often than a lot of other people. And um, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I did a little bit of research just on, you know, um, you know, bicycle planning in our area and stuff. And I didn't see anything and I could have missed it. Of course, I didn't do deep, deep research, but I didn't really see anything on them talking to people with disabilities. I saw a lot of a lot of like, oh, people of different ages of different, uh, um, you know, whether they're commuters or whether they're doing it for recreation, different skill levels, things like that, but not really people with disabilities. So I think we need to be part of the conversation for sure. Totally, yeah, that's a good, that's a good reminder for all you out there doing bicycle outreach. Devin, any closing remarks, feedback? Sure, yeah, and I would say, I mean, I really want to echo what, what Leroy said about um, universalism, right? Um, you know, we, we need to make public investment in a lot of things, um, and they should be universally accessible, universally affordable, et cetera, right? And, um, you know, the idea that if we're building infrastructure, for example, for the people that have the hardest time using it, uh, that means that everyone else is going to benefit. Um, it's going to make it easier for everybody, um, you know, whether that's through induced demand for cycling or for transit um, or just or safety or crossing, you know, taking your kid to school, walking your kid to school. Um, 
you know, I think so that's very, very important. Um, you know, and then understanding as well that everything that we do is intersectional. It's all connected. Uh, I saw in the chat there was a question about who, you know, who do you partner with who are not bicycle advocates? And I would say, I in my trend, the transportation work I do in the office, most of the organizations that I work with are not cyclist organizations. Um, and, and that's because um, I don't consider myself to be a cyclist, for example. And just like Kim said, you know, she's a girl on a bike. I'm a guy on a bike. Um, and that doesn't define us, our way of getting around the city, um, you know, and so working with organizations that understand your neighborhood, cultural organizations, um, housing organizations, tenant organizations, everybody's affected by this. And so I think that is my one takeaway I really want to leave with people um, is that everyone's affected. And so everybody, um, you know, the power of coalition is going to be your, your biggest, um, your biggest ally in the fight. Awesome. I'm going to leave it at that and turn it back over to Amelia and the folks in the room. Um, thank you so much for joining me, panelists. Your expertise is, as always, um, incredible. And uh, I hope um, for those of you who are listening, you're uh, uh, thinking about who you can reach out to in your community who's usually not at the table um, and make sure that their voices are part of the conversation. So thank you all. Um, I don't know, Amelia, do you want to say anything else or should we go ahead and uh, close it out? I guess also just, um, we didn't have a chance to respond to the chat very much, but I will try to be on Wuva, Woba, the app and answering questions there. So if you want to get in touch, I think we're all on the app. You can reach out to us there and when we'll answer questions online. Yeah, that's awesome. I just wanted to say thank you, and we've got the room here, so I'm going to let everybody applaud for you. <laughs> Huge thank you to all four of you, and again, thanks, Anna, for bringing this awesome group together. Um, and we'll put a link in the chat uh, to the video I attempted to play at the beginning, and if you guys in the room want to stay, uh, stick around, I'll play it after the Zoom call in. So thanks again, everybody. Take care. And uh, yeah, have a great day. See you all online for the next session at 3.45 Eastern. All righty. Thanks. Bye. And if you want the link to the video, just stay on and I'll put it in the chat in a minute unless somebody else already has. <laughs>